Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me pleasure to welcome all of you on behalf of India International Center and Mr. Binoy K. Behel. Today's illustrated talk marks 30 years since Mr. Behel first gave his talk, Ajanta Rediscovered, for India International Center in 1991. At that time, Mr. Behel became famous around the world for his unique photography in low light of the Ajanta paintings with which he had revealed their true colors and details for the first time. 20 years ago, Mr. Behel and his office digitally restored the Ajanta paintings and other ancient murals of India to reveal what they may have looked like many centuries ago. This work was done with painstaking care and was guided not only by Mr. Behel's eye as an art historian, but also his deep intimacy with the paintings of Ajanta. During the course of the pandemic, Mr. Behel has had occasion to look at his early work and has decided to bring the legacy of this labor of love before the world. This work has also recently been saved in the Arctic World Arf Archive, Norway, to be preserved for posterity. About the speaker, Binoy K. Behel. How does one speak of an art historian who is a respected speaker at a breathtakingly long list of prestigious universities and museums worldwide, yet art history is only one part of his life's mission. He is a filmmaker who has made over 145 deeply researched documentary films. He is an eminent photographer, Buddhist scholar, and record setting traveler. Mr. Behel is the first Indian about whom the American National Geographic magazine has done an extensive story. BBC World News have carried three news items about his work in India and in Vietnam. His book, The Ajanta Caves, is among the most widely read books on Indian art history in the world. In 2023, Thames and Hudson London are bringing out a new edition of the book, including his restored images, which you are about to see this evening. Behel's book, The Art of India, Sculpture and Mural Painting, in two volumes, has been recently published. It is a rare book which presents Indian art from all over the vast country, including remote and high-altitude regions. His book, Buddhism, The Path of Compassion, covers the Buddhist heritage of the world in 20 countries. Before Behel's work, the history of Indian painting was studied from the medieval period onwards. His documentation has clearly established the fact that there was a continuous and great tradition of painting in India coming from ancient times. Ladies and gentlemen, art historian, filmmaker, and photographer Benoit K. Behel presents Ajanta Digitally Restored. Over to Mr. Behel now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sujata Chatiji. My grateful thanks are owed to the India International Center who since uh, 1979 have very kindly been showing my films and holding my lectures, beginning with my film on uh, another look at Khadi. My heartfelt thanks to Mr. N. N. Bora, president of uh, IIC, uh, for his uh, warm invitation to me to uh, give this talk uh, today and it is always such a pleasure to work with uh, Tete 
the director programs of uh, IIC. Thank you so much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lawrence Binion, the director of the British Museum, wrote in 1930 that whoever begins a study of the Buddhist art of uh, China and Japan uh, begins on a long journey which will eventually bring him to Ajanta. Such is the fundamental importance of the paintings of Ajanta in uh, Asian art. In uh, 1990, the Archaeological Survey of India brought to my attention that uh, these important paintings had never been clearly photographed, owing to the fact that uh, strong lights are not allowed inside the caves, as these would uh, damage uh, the ancient paintings. I uh, was already becoming a little known at that time for having, uh, they say, invented a technique of uh, photography in extremely low light, which I uh, used then to photograph uh, these paintings in 1991. The photography was uh, very well received and uh, uh, scholars around the world said that uh, they had never seen the paintings of Ajanta in their true colors and details like uh, my photography had now revealed. I was invited immediately by uh, the most important uh, museums and universities of the world to come and uh, lecture and to show these paintings. So that was the, the British Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, the University of London, the Smithsonian Institution, the Tokyo National University, etc. There was a very large number of uh, institutions that uh, very kindly called me to, to show this work. And you would be happy to know the, uh, that there was a unanimous response of the uh, art historians and uh, art critics who were gathered at these capitals of art uh, of the world. And that unanimous response, ladies and gentlemen, was that these paintings of Ajanta must surely be the finest art of humankind. And they took pains to mention that uh, there was much in the paintings, much technical virtuosity in the paintings, which, for instance, uh, the art of uh, the Western world only acquired in the a thousand years later, in the period of the late Renaissance. There were other qualities they found in the paintings, which, in fact, uh, they said that Western art. Uh, had uh, achieved only later than the Renaissance. This is only to these qualities which were only found in the uh, Impressionist paintings and in the uh, Expressionist uh, paintings. But more than all this technical virtuosity of which there was so much, what makes these paintings so valuable for the world and so truly beautiful is the vision of life which they contain. It is a vision which sees the same in you and me and in all the animals, the birds, the trees, the flowers. It is the same spirit which moves in all that there is. And it is this which imparts a great compassion to every line, every stroke of the painter's brush. And it is this which makes these paintings so very special. However, it was only when uh, in the next year, in 1992, 
I photograph the uh, paintings of the end 10th century of the Brahadishwara temple at Tanjavur that uh, art historians uh, uh, internationally inform me that they would have to revise their understanding of the history of Indian painting. And when I asked, why is that so? I was told that uh, the paintings of Ajanta had been known, but because paintings in India before Ajanta were not known, and paintings in India for the next 800 years after Ajanta were not known, these Ajanta paintings had been treated like a flash in the pan. They had not been considered to be part of a, a continuous tradition of painting in India. And when I was now showing these uh, 10th century paintings, which had the same technical qualities, virtuosity as the Ajanta paintings of the fifth century, then it was obvious that there was actually a great tradition of painting flowing through ancient times in India. Subsequently, I had the good fortune to go on and to uh, document other paintings in India, remnants of paintings of the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. And so we have before us clearly established a marvelous tradition of uh, ancient paintings, which in fact uh, is the uh, foundation of the medieval paintings to come later. Now, the philosophy of aesthetics was developed in a very early period in India. In this, it is understood that our response when we see something truly beautiful in nature or in art is akin to Brahmanand or the final bliss of salvation itself. For in that moment, the veils of illusion of the material world Maya or Mithya are lifted and we are able to see the grace which underlies all that there is. And from that you would understand why there was so much art in Indian temples and caves and why art was of such fundamental importance in the uh, ancient Indian traditions. Now, when you look at these exquisite uh, deities that are brought before you in this art, you must remember that there are no gods in the uh, ancient Indian philosophic tradition coming from the Upanishads. There are deities Deities who are the personifications of concepts and qualities within yourself, like uh, wisdom, compassion, the boundless energy, the courage with which you may meet the demons of your ignorance. And when we look upon these deities, when we respond to these deities in art, when we respond to their grace, it awakens the same grace within us. And it is hoped that that grace will continue to grow within us until one day that grace fills us completely. And at that point, you have become the deity. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will uh, share my screen and uh, take you into the world of these beautiful paintings. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is that uh, enchanted place, the gorge of the Vaghura River in Western India in Maharashtra, where uh, is located this uh, fountainhead of the Buddhist art of the world. 31 caves were excavated here in two periods. One period around the second century BCE and the second around the fifth century CE. And uh, these caves were uh, 
exquisitely sculpted and carved and their uh, walls and ceilings were entirely covered by uh, beautiful paintings, some of which uh, survive uh, till today. Now, before I photograph these paintings, these, this is how the paintings were seen and known to be, because only orangish light was cast upon them, because um, the lights used to be running on a dimmer at, uh, uh, or on running on electricity, coming through a dimmer at uh, low voltage, so as to purposely cast only orangish light, as it was believed that the blues and greens in the paintings would uh, damage them much more considerably. However, I, ha I had the good fortune to photograph the uh, true colors of this painting, as you may enjoy seeing here the blues and greens which had been lost in the uh, orangish light were indeed beautiful. And you might notice that uh, with this low light uh, photography, uh, the details, look at that crown, come out uh, so exceedingly well. And I had the good fortune of uh, giving this talk uh, for the India International Center on Ajanta rediscovered back in 1991. However, there is much uh, damage uh, uh, on the paintings. You see here a painting which in fact fills me with awe because this is the uh, oldest uh, surviving painting of the classic tradition in India and in Asia. And this painting is of the second century BCE in cave 10 of Ajanta. However, as you see, much uh, early 20th century uh, graffiti has obscured the paintings and uh, one is not able to uh, see the painting very well. So 20 years ago, I took it upon myself and uh, use the resources of my office to sit down and very carefully, painstakingly, try to restore, to restore the paintings a little bit so that we may get an idea of what the painting looked like. And this was the result. It's an amazing painting for the second century BCE. In that period, you certainly did not easily expect to see such expressions upon the faces. In fact, uh, the eyes are so well made, the different kinds of looks in the eyes. If you look at the figure on the left bottom, that inward look, which becomes a hallmark of ancient Indian art, that inward look which makes the Indian ancient art to be among the most beautiful work of humankind is already here in this early period in the second century BCE. And uh, see the dancer, even the dancer has that quality which you find in Indian art. With all the activity of the body, there is a stillness of expression. There is a stillness in the eyes, beautiful. You would of course notice uh, the uh, clothing, you would notice the wonderful jewelry and so much more. And so this is that wonderful painting of the second century BCE. Now, even of the fifth century period, uh, the paintings were uh, uh, considerably damaged. In fact, uh, in around 1930, uh, Italian restorers were called by the Nizam of Hyderabad, who, under who, whose rule came the Ajanta Caves at that time. And they painted, they covered the paintings with shellac, a kind of varnish, which they thought at that time was the best way to preserve the paintings. 
However, with time, the shellac uh, aged, it uh, yellowed in color, it collected soot and blackened, and the paintings were, uh, to a large extent, obscured. Now, this is a painting of uh, a dark princess, fifth century painting in uh, cave one, which had been uh, spoken about by uh, early visitors and uh, uh, British uh, artists and art historians as a very beautiful painting. Yet, there's not much that one could see. So using also the reference of uh, early uh, uh, painted reproductions to get the, the color right. And uh, with due care, I was able to work on the painting and, and indeed some of the beauty definitely can still be seen. How marvelous at an early age, what depth of expression, what sheer beauty, uh, what what a heritage! What a what a marvelous uh, tradition of art we have here. So also here is a, another masterpiece which shows uh, Yashodra and Rahul uh, in front of uh, uh, Gautama Siddhartha Buddha. They are looking up at him. And uh, there is, of course, a lot of damage which obscures uh, the painting. So very carefully, very gently, the least amount of restoration, really, just enough to, to make the painting more visible uh, for us. And uh, there you are. You might notice the stray curl of hair upon her right shoulder which uh, in a way accentuates the fact that uh, she is uh, pining. She is, her husband has left her and gone away and she is pining. You might also notice the play of light, which is uh, done much in the way that we use light in uh, photography even today. We call it side light and backlight to bring out the roundedness of the human form. And such is the beauty of the work of, uh, of uh, these paintings of around the fifth century. The glorious Vajrapani, Bodhisattva Vajrapani, uh, bearer of the thunderbolt, bringing before us the majesty of the spirit. Marvelous painting, though you would notice that uh, there is damage, there is a uh, there's a little damage everywhere. You would notice the damage on the crown. So just a little restoration, which helps to reveal the painting more clearly without the distraction of the damage. And here he is, uh, the Vajrapani, the bearer of the Vajra. The Vajra is one of the uh, very earliest symbols in uh, Indian thought and art. It is the thunderbolt. And it is uh, also uh, uh, carried by uh, Lord Indra, one of the uh, earliest deities seen in Indian art. Uh, you see him, uh, his earliest representation of the uh, second century BCE in the Buddhist caves at uh, Bhaja. And the Vajra continues uh, in, in, till today, one of the latest uh, form of Buddhism popular around the world is called Vajrayana Buddhism, the vehicle of the thunderbolt, as its uh, logic is supposed to be as clear and as striking as a thunderbolt. And so we have here the majesty of the spirit. And also in cave one, uh, you have the Bodhisattva Padmapani. And uh, it's always recognized to be uh, 
one of the greatest masterpieces of the Ajanta paintings of around the fifth century. And there is uh, some damage you would notice on his eye and in so many other places. And uh, here we are, a little restored, just so that uh, we are not uh, distracted by the damage. And whereas uh, the Vajrapani had shown us the majesty of the spirit within us, the Padmapani, the bearer of the lotus, brings before us the peace of the spirit within us. With all the activity of life around, he looks within. It is this look within. It is this peace to be found within which is the subject of ancient Indian art. It takes us away from the noise and clamor of the material world around to the joy which can only be found within us. Uh, one of my uh, earliest uh, favorites among the Ajanta paintings are these two figures looking towards uh, King Mahajanak, who is uh, riding out of the palace, leaving his worldly life behind. He's going to become an ascetic. And the two of them are uh, looking with uh, infinite compassion at, uh, at King Mahajanak. And it is this spirit of uh, caring for others, which fills the world of these paintings. The thousands of figures which are painted across the walls of Ajanta are filled with this, this immense warmth, this concern, this kindness towards others. And uh, I've always called this particular detail, the glance of compassion. How beautiful it is. And uh, here we have a painting uh, from the Shaddanta Jatak in cave 17. And again, it has been a little restored to make it uh, more visible. The Shaddanta Jatak uh, was about these uh, large, uh, it showed these large elephants. You would notice the feet of one elephant in the upper right part of this frame. So while uh, the painter made such large creatures of the world, if you look at the branch of the tree close to this man's head, I'll take you to a closer view and a restored one. And yes, those are ants climbing up that tree. And if you go to Ajanta, you most likely will not see them. But for the painter, the world would not be complete without these little ants. Immense lessons are to be learned from the vision of compassion of uh, the painters of uh, ancient times. Such, such marvelous warmth for all of existence. And it gave two, again, uh, for around the fifth century uh, CE period, uh, the birth of Buddha and uh, a little restored to make it easier for you to see. There is a Queen uh, Maya from under whose raised arm <clears throat> Gautama Siddhartha was born. And you have uh, Lord Indra and Lord Brahma who have come to receive the baby. And uh, here one may mention that uh, uh, Indra and Brahma still continue to be deeply worshipped in uh, Buddhism. In fact, uh, even till today, uh, all the uh, Buddhist temples of Japan have representations of uh, Indra and uh, Brahma. And of course, as I mentioned before, 
the earliest representation of Lord Indra in India is in the Buddhist cave of uh, Bhaja in uh, Western India, Maharashtra. And uh, Queen uh, Janapada Kalyani, uh, wife of uh, King Nanda, half brother of uh, the Buddha, I'll take you to a, a little restored, more visible uh, painting. And uh, in fact, uh, her husband, King Nanda, had also renounced the world. And uh, he has uh, come back to the uh, palace uh, door as a bhikshu begging for arms. And here is the queen scene uh, inside. And uh, how beautifully the whole painting is made, how beautifully the eyes are made, the different expressions are made. If you look at the queen with that, that deeply thoughtful expression upon her face, if you look at the, the attendant, the, the, the uh, palace uh, maid in front of her, you see the uh, great uh, caring upon her face. You see the figure further down to the right corner. The expressions, the caring which is, which is shown, it is uh, most unexpected in uh, art of this early period. And uh, it, is, it is a treasure which, and I hope that this uh, restoration will help people to be able to see these paintings more clearly, appreciate them a little more, and help to uh, preserve this great legacy. And uh, Queen Shivali, in a painting uh, of uh, Cave One around the fifth century CE. Uh, I'll take you, there's much damage. You notice the damage of the nose, the damage in the lower part of the picture, I'll take you to a little restored uh, image. And uh, well, uh, Queen Shivali is here, hearing the news from her husband, King Mahajanaka, a bodhisattva, a being on his way to salvation, a previous birth of Lord Buddha. Uh, she's hearing from him that he is going to be uh, giving up the palace and uh, going out into the forest as an ascetic. Now her eyes are painted in a very particular way. Uh, by the time these paintings were made, in fact, uh, the earliest known treatise on art making in the world, the Chitra Sutra, had been penned. And the Chitra Sutra gives thousands of guidelines to the painter on how to make landscapes, how to make animals, how to make uh, trees and birds and flowers and different kinds of human beings and different expressions upon their faces. And as a part of that, uh, there are five different shapes of eyes which are suggested, which would convey different uh, expressions. And Queen Shivali's eyes here are painted exactly in the way of a person who is sad or weeping, as indeed you may expect her to be, because her husband is saying that he is going to uh, uh, leave her and go away into the forest. You might notice her lower garment, which is woven in the form of ikkat, which is practiced till today across the Deccan, the Western Deccan in Maharashtra, the Eastern Deccan in uh, uh, Andhra Pradesh. And uh, her upper garment, for there is an upper garment which is practically transparent, and you will see some design upon it on her hip. This upper garment reminds you that India was at that time very famous for uh, its uh, finest of textiles. In fact, uh, Pliny the Elder in Rome is writing in the first century that Roman coffers are being emptied for buying too many fine textiles from India. A century later, Emperor Vesuvian is saying practically the same thing. Now, I'll draw your attention to the strings of pearls which dangle below her bosom. 
And you might notice the curve in those pearl strings. And it is that curve which persuades your eye of the movement. And uh, such exquisite details were not only already being made at that time in these paintings, but in fact, they're also mentioned uh, for the artist to note uh, and follow uh, in the Chitra Sutra. Amazing details. We move on to uh, other Buddhist paintings, scarcely seen, uh, practically unknown of the fifth century. And this is in the uh, Buddhist caves of uh, Pital Khoda, about an hour and a half drive uh, down the highway away from uh, Elora Caves. And uh, here you have, again, that exquisite expressions, the beautiful eyes, the uh, gentlest of uh, expressions. And uh, again, painting of the Buddhist tradition of the fifth uh, century. And uh, here is uh, another detail from uh, the fifth century paintings of uh, Pital Khoda. And uh, with a little restoration, a little clearer, and this is a worshiper. Now, the worshiper is a chori bearer, even though he is uh, gloriously crowned, he's got a glorious crown, and yet, as a devotee, he bears a chori, a whisk. And such is the humility which you see even of uh, the rulers of ancient uh, times. Before the rule of the spirit, before the importance of the spirit within us, before the importance of uh, the spiritual journey, even, even regal figures with such crowns, become humble and you find them wear, uh, bearing a chori. This has sometimes confused uh, uh, some Western art historians because they've not been able to figure out is it a chori bearer or is it a crowned uh, regal figure. And here we see the uh, earliest uh, surviving painting of the uh, Hindu tradition. This is of the uh, 6th uh, century CE and the painting of a uh, queen in attendance as you see here is uh, from the caves of uh, Badami which have uh, caves of the Jain and uh, Hindu uh, traditions. And again, uh, though not much survives uh, on those uh, cave walls uh, today. In fact, uh, even what uh, I had seen and photographed uh, uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, even that, even this is not uh, so much surviving as was found by uh, National Geographic. When, when National Geographic were doing a story about my work and going to the places that I had photographed, they were not able to find uh, uh, really uh, identify this painting at all. So uh, I'm glad that I managed to photograph it uh, in 2001. And uh, well, here you are, uh, digitally restored uh, 20 years ago. And uh, you would notice that same gentleness of expression, that tender expression, those inward looks, which gives so much beauty, so much meaning to this art, which helps us to begin our own journey within. Madhami, sixth century, earliest painting of the uh, Hindu tradition, which survives today. And uh, here we have uh, the uh, great uh, Brahadishvara temple of the end of the 10th century, at uh, Tanjavur. And though you can't make out in this uh, photograph very well, but there is a metal stairway going up to the side of the tower, 
which takes you inside an uh, uh, inner ambulatory, which goes around the Garbhagriha. And uh, that has uh, paintings on it uh, going up to a height of 20 feet. And these paintings had not been uh, uh, clearly photographed uh, before until uh, I was asked to take the photographs uh, in 1992. And the absolutely glorious paintings which helped me to establish uh, uh, a continuous tradition of uh, painting uh, in India. And uh, well, there is, there is in, in many instances a fair amount of damage of the paintings. And here you see uh, a little restored uh, image of this, uh, this worshiper. And you would see, as in the other ancient art that you saw, that infinite gentleness of expression. It is a worshiper that awakens the feeling of worship and adoration within you. you that grace fills you when you look at this humble, beautiful, graceful uh, figures. So this is the end of the 10th century, Bradishvara temple at uh, Tanjavur. And here you have another detail uh, uh, from the Bradishvara uh, 10th uh, century paintings and a little restored for you to be able to see this uh, more clearly. And this is, uh, uh, looks like it is a panda from uh, Banaras carrying his, uh, very typical little uh, sunshade. And in his hand, he has what uh, uh, looks like uh, a Janampatri or uh, uh, the astrological details of uh, uh, somebody's uh, birth time. And uh, marvelous paintings, paintings which uh, are uh, which which convey exactly in terms of expression and in terms of uh, uh, technical virtuosity, the uh, painter seems to be fully in control of his medium. And here we move on to uh, uh, an early uh, Buddhist uh, monastery at uh, Nako at about uh, 13,500 feet altitude in a trans-Himalayan uh, part of, uh, of uh, Kinor in Himachal Pradesh. And the, the, these paintings were made uh, by Kashmiri artists who were invited for the purpose of uh, painting and sculpting a legendary chain of uh, 108 uh, Buddhist monasteries which were made in the around the 11th century in um, Ladakh, Lahore, Spiti, Kinnor, and Western Tibet. And they were exquisitely painted by the Kashmiri artists. Uh, and this was just about uh, a century or so after Abhinav Gupt, one of the best known Indian uh, philosophers of aesthetics, was living in the Valley of Kashmir. Truly the art of Kashmir is uh, some of the uh, uh, finest art uh, of uh, the Buddhist uh, and Hindu tradition. And this again is uh, uh, a Mandala deity in uh, Nako, same location as you, as you just saw in the last detail. And um, these are all uh, very finely made small paintings. This uh, roundel in, in, inside which you see this painting uh, would be just uh, about uh, less than, just about three inches inside uh, across in a diameter. And yet within that uh, small space, such grace is captured so beautifully. That uh, tilt of the head, that, uh, beautiful, lyrical grace, which reminds you that there is an end to the sorrow of the world. 
Naku, Kinor, uh, around uh, the 11th century. And uh, the uh, tradition of uh, painting, the tradition of uh, Buddhist paintings, traveled uh, from the shores of India to the many countries of uh, Asia. And uh, this painting that you see is uh, from uh, the uh, from Polonaruva in uh, Sri Lanka. And these are again uh, Buddhist paintings. And uh, you see this uh, devotee here. And these paintings are uh, very similar to the paintings of uh, the uh, Bradishwara temple. And indeed, uh, there was the influence of the Cholas in this part of uh, Sri Lanka at that time. And with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I come to the end of uh, this uh, brief selection of uh, paintings, restored paintings, which I had uh, put together for you uh, to show you this evening. I must share that it has been, it has been a, a glorious journey. It has been a wonderful journey since I photographed the paintings of Ajanta for the first time. It has been uh, many, many moments of bliss, of joy, of peace. This tradition has been uh, very enriching uh, for me. And I hope uh, a little enriching for those that I've had the good fortune to share it with. My many thanks once again to the uh, India International Center for this opportunity to share all this with you. Thank you all so much.